A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering Chapter 8 from our Genetics Essentials Concepts and Connections 4th Editions textbook. This chapter deals with DNA and the chemical nature of the gene. So let's get started. A lot of this should be review. Remember that DNA is the source of genetic information for living uh, organisms. This includes all three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, eukarya. And the structure of DNA came about with Watson and Crick and uh, also, very importantly, Rosalind Franklin and her actual research uh, along with her mentor, uh, Maurice Wilkins. Uh, what Rosalind Franklin had done was what's known as an X-ray crystallography study. X-ray crystallography is a process that reveals the structure of molecules by first forming an, uh, a crystal of a molecule. So if you want to know the structure of a protein or a Nucleo, uh, nucleic acid, you can make a crystal out of that protein or nucleic acid. You can dehydrate down, and once you dehydrate high concentrations of DNA, for instance, it'll form a crystal of DNA, an actual crystal of DNA. Uh, and once you have your crystal formed of DNA or protein or whatever else you're trying to figure out the structure of, you would then bombard the crystal with x-rays. So x-rays go through a lead screen. They strike the, uh, the crystal embedded with uh, DNA. And then there's a diffraction or a bouncing off that happens of those x-rays. And that, that diffraction or bouncing off is captured on a detector, a photographic plate. And then once you have that data, you can analyze the diffraction pattern and that will reveal the structure of the embedded substance in the crystal. So this is what Rosalind Franklin was up to. She got a pattern very similar to what you see here and this shows a round pattern, almost like a helical pattern. And what Watson and Crick, actually Watson was the one who saw this data, he had the idea that DNA is helical, uh, but he based it off of uh, Rosalind's actual results, actual data here. So here's the Watson on the left and Crick on the right. Watson was the student of Crick's, and this is their uh, proposed double-strand uh, DNA that uh, w ended up being the correct structure of DNA. But again, it was based on uh, the actual work, laboratory work, of Rosalind. So now we know the primary structure of DNA, and we know that it's based on the subunits deoxyribonucleotides. It's these nucleotides that are the building blocks of DNA and, and RNA. In DNA, it's deoxyribonucleotides, RNA's building blocks are ribonucleotides. We'll get into that. So the nucleotides are the building blocks of DNA and RNA. This should be review from Biology 1406. If it isn't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a, uh, a link here. I'm going to go ahead and add that right after this video. I'm going to add a link here to your notes for a video I have. I'm also going to throw a card up above. And this card will take you to another video where I explain in detail the structure of DNA from my biology 1406 class. So if you need a very basic refresher on DNA structure, um, watch that video. That's my biology 1406 video. I go into great detail about how nucleotides work, how they link together, uh, the phosphodiester bonds that form, you know, to make the double strand helix and how the, how the base pairing works and all of that. So check that video out if you want to, but, uh, we'll, we'll try to, we'll try to do another review here. So the nucleotides, uh, 
again, are the building blocks of DNA and RNA. They're composed of three parts. There's three parts to a nucleotide, a pentose sugar, which there's two flavors, one pentose sugar uh, called deoxyribose for DNA, and another pentose sugar called ribose for RNA, a phosphate group, a phosphate group, and a base. These are the nitrogenous bases. In DNA, those are A's, G's, C's, and T's. In RNA, substitute U's for the T's. That's the difference there. Nucleotide structure. We're going to cover nucleotide structure in more detail. And we're going to cover uh, the purine and pyrimidine bases, the, the nitrogenous bases, in more detail to come. So check this out. These are the pentose sugars I told you about. This is the sugar in uh, the nucleotide of ribose. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the nucleotide of RNA is ribose. This is the ribose sugar, which is found in what? It's found in RNA nucleotides. This one on the right, this is deoxyribose sugar. This is the pentose deoxyribose. And this is found in what? This is found in DNA. And do you notice the difference? You see this pink box? This is the difference here. Ribose has a hydroxyl group here, and, and deoxyribose is missing that oxygen. It only has a hydrogen group. So that's why it's called deoxyribose. De deoxyribose. It's missing that oxygen, right? And by the way, you need to remember this uh, counting system here, uh, of this system of numbering the carbons in this pentose. Pentose means it has five carbons. This is the anomeric carbon, the first carbon. Carbon one, two, three, four, five. Carbon one, two, three, four, five. And you see this little apostrophe by the one? That's prime. So geneticists refer to this carbon as the one prime carbon, this carbon as the two prime carbon, this carbon as the three prime carbon, four prime carbon, and five prime carbon. This is very important to genetics. You need to know that when geneticists are talking about the three prime end or the five prime end or the three prime carbon or the two prime carbon, they're talking about the sugar, and they're talking about these carbons in this row, in, in this order. Does that make sense? You need to know this if you're going to understand genetics. When a geneticist, uh, you know, have you ever heard the expression, the five prime end of the DNA, or the, th the three prime end of the DNA, or, you know, have you heard those terms? This is what they're talking about. When they're talking about the five prime end of DNA or RNA, they're talking about what's going on at this end, on whatever's attached, they're talking about what's attached to this carbon. If they're talking about the three prime end of the DNA, they're talking about this end here. They're talking about this right here, this hydroxyl group. Three prime end, five prime end. So if I were to tell you what's the difference between ribose and deoxyribose, what would you say? Well, you would say the difference is that ribose has a hydroxyl OH. Ribose has a hydroxyl group attached to the two prime carbon of the sugar, whereas deoxyribose only has a hydrogen attached to the two prime carbon of the sugar. You see that? So if you can understand that, you're in good shape. Now here's a little bit about the nitrogenous bases. These are the uh, another component of the nucleotides. Remember, nitrogenous bases come in two structural forms. The two ring form called the purines and the one ring pyrimidines. I have a really neat uh, way of remembering this and I, and I shared this with my biology 1406 class and that is uh, the acronym CUT. C-U-T, cut. Just remember that one pyramid, you know, because pyramids have sharp edges, right? And this is a goofy way of remembering which ones are the purines and which ones are the pyrimidines. One pyramid 
could cut you. Just remember that saying, right? Why would that help you remember this concept? Well, look, the pyrimidines are the one ring structures, nitrogenous bases. Those include cut, cytosine, also known as C, uracil, U, and thymine, T, cut, C, U, T. One ring, one pyramid, pyramid sounds like pyrimidine, could cut, right? So if you're ever wondering which ones are the pyrimidines, just remember that one pyramid could cut you. That little phrase can help you out because you'll remember that the one means the one ring nitrogenous bases. Pyramid sounds like pyrimidine could cut. The C's, U's, and T's are the pyrimidines. All right, now the pyrenes, on the other hand, have two rings, two rings, and they include adenine A and guanine G. Okay, now do you guys remember from Biology 1406, a uh, complementary base pairing? Uh, remember in strands of DNA that you have complementary base pairing between these nitrogenous bases. Do you remember which base pairs with what? Do you guys remember? Well, what do A's pair with? What do A's pair with? What's the complement for an A, adenine? It's a T, thymine. How many hydrogen bonds form between them when they pair? Do you remember that? You need to know that. Two hydrogen bonds form between A's and T's in DNA. Okay. What about G's in DNA? Um, what do G's pair up with? C's. And then you have to know how many hydrogen bonds form between the G's and the C's. Three. Three hydrogen bonds form between G's and C's when they pair. Now the only difference in RNA, it, RNA can also base pair with complements, right? But in RNA, remember, there are no T's, there are no thymines in RNA. Instead, there are U's, right? So in RNA, this is the same. Look, what does G pair with in RNA? It pairs with C. Now in RNA, what does A pair with? That's right, A pairs with U, uracil, okay? So the only difference between complementary base pairing in DNA and RNA is that in DNA, A's pair with T. In RNA, A's pair with U. So in DNA, A's pair with T. In RNA, A's pair with U. Okay? And this is the third component of a nucleotide. Remember, what was the first component of a nucleotide? The pentose sugar, uh, either R uh, ribose or deoxyribose. The other component of the nucleotide was A's, G's, C's, and T's in DNA, and then U's, substitute for T's in RNA. And now we're talking about the third component of a nucleotide. What is that? Well, that's a phosphate group, isn't it? A phosphate group. And this phosphate group, remember, phosphate is a functional group. We learned about it in biology 1406. Biology 1406 showed us that, you know, um, a nucleotide is composed of these three, three factors. Now, let's do a quick concept check. Concept check number four. How do the sugars of RNA and DNA differ? Remember, uh, let's go through these and, and figure it out. RNA has a six carbon sugar, that should be wrong right away. Remember, they both have pentose sugars. Pentose means five carbon sugar, not six carbon sugar. Six carbon sugar would be like glucose. That is not right. The sugar of RNA has a hydroxyl group that is not found in the sugar of DNA. Isn't that correct? Yeah, remember the two prime carbon of uh, ribose, um, of the RNA sugar has the hydroxyl group. The two prime carbon on DNA's deoxyribose does not, so it should be B, right? There you go, B. Let's see why these ones would have been wrong as well. RNA contains uracil, DNA contains thymine. Well, that doesn't help you uh, 
to understand how the sugars differ. You see, this is actually a trick question, see? Because RNA does contain uracil and DNA does contain thymine, but that doesn't actually answer the question about why the sugars are different. Does that make sense? So you could have gotten tricked by C. You could have said, oh yeah, C is correct. And it is correct statement, but it is not why the sugars differ. That's a trick question. I don't like that. Uh, DNA's sugar has a phosphorus atom. RNA's sugar does not. I don't even know what all that means. Um, so then we're going on to table 8.2, which is simply showing you uh, a little bit more detail about the nitrogenous bases, adenine, uh, guanine, thymine, cytosine. So when you're talking about the nucleotides, adenine is abbreviated A, guanine is G, thymine is T, cytosine is C. And then, you, you know, you can also abbreviate it with the nucleotide symbol, D-A-M-P, for deoxy-A-adenine monophosphate, deoxy-guanine monophosphate, deoxy-thymine monophosphate, deoxy-cytosine monophosphate. So let's take a look at these nucleotides. Check that out. These are the complete nucleotides. What did I tell you? Um, and these are for what? This must be for DNA, right? Because look, I don't see a hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon. So I can tell that this is these are DNA nucleotides. Uh, this here is adenine, uh, A, guanine, thymine, cytosine. And remember what I told you, they have three parts, the phosphate group, the pentose sugar. Uh, in the case of DNA, it's deoxy ribose and then you have the nitrogenous base this is the part of the nucleotide that gives you the a g c or t value right this is a adenine this is g guanine uh, those are your purines remember two ring these are the two ring nitrogenous bases then down here you have um, thymine and cytosine these are the pyrimidines the one ring nitrogenous basis. So these are the building blocks of DNA. So let's uh, hop into the next section here. And it's talking about the, the secondary structure of DNA. So we're talking about when it forms the double helix, what does the backbone look like of the double helix? You know, how does the hydrogen bonding work? Uh, are the two strands of DNA parallel or anti-parallel? Let's hop into this. So here is a example. Here is a double strand DNA. You can see that you have a strand on the left of DNA and a strand on the right. Now what I want you to realize are several things here. Again, they're all highlighted in my g 1406 video so if you need a refresher check that out but here's here's what you need to understand first of all you need to know that dna is directional what do i mean look at this strand of dna here you see this strand this is a nucleotide you see what i'm circling right now that's a nucleotide and it's linked to the next nucleotide here's the second nucleotide here's the third nucleotide and here's the fourth nucleotide. So this strand of DNA is actually four nucleotides long. See, one, two, three, four. And do you see how the nucleotides are linked to one another? Let's look at these two nucleotides. See, this nucleotide attaches to this nucleotide. How did they attach? Do you guys remember? Look, here's the first nucleotide. It's phosphate group, you see? It's the 5 prime phosphate. The 5 prime phosphate attaches to the 3 prime hydroxyl group on the next on the next nucleotide, or in this case it would be the 3 prime uh, carbon on the next nucleotide. And then this nucleotide, its 5 prime phosphate attaches to the next 3 prime carbon and so on and so forth. So because of how nucleotides link together, like I said, um, you have the five prime phosphate group on the five prime carbon, 
and that links to the 3 prime hydroxyl uh, on the 3 prime carbon on the next on the next nucleotide that's how you link nucleotides together and because that's how you link nucleotides together you're aren't you always going to have a phosphate group at one end right of a strand and what's at the other end of the strand let's go to the other end of the strand what do you have here and a 3 prime end you see a 3 prime OH at this end and a 5 prime phosphate group at this end did you guys follow that DNA is directional because when you link the strands together when you link DNA uh, nucleotides together right when you link nucleotides together you get a strand of DNA correct at one end a phosphate group will hang off that phosphate groups attached to the 5 prime carbon and at the other end there's a hydroxyl group hanging off of the 3 prime carbon does that make sense so because of that DNA has two, two um, ends it's got the 5 prime end with a phosphate group hanging off and it has a 3 prime end with a hydroxyl group hanging off and do you remember um, what, uh, that there are two strands right of DNA do they both go in the same direction do they both have the phosphate group at one end and the hydroxyl group at the other end no look at the arrows you see look at the arrows here the two strands of DNA go in anti-parallel direction opposite directions so you need to know that if this is the 5 prime end with the phosphate group of this strand of DNA well then on the complement it's the 3 prime end and the and the other the other side of the DNA as well if this is the 5 prime end of this strand that means on the complement it's the 3 prime end of that complement strand does that make sense Hopefully that's a refresher from Biology 1406. Now look at this. Do you see do you see what I'm what I'm pointing to here? This is called the backbone of DNA. You see what I'm highlighting right now? This is called the backbone of the strand, backbone of the DNA. What's the backbone made out of? They call this the sugar, remember? Uh, the deoxyribose, sugar, phosphate group, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. They call this the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. Sugar phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And so there's a backbone of sugar phosphate here, and there's a backbone of sugar phosphate here. See, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. So that's why they call it the sugar phosphate backbone. Now, the side chains in this case are the nitrogenous bases. The nitrogenous bases poke out into the middle of the double helix here, you see? The, the, the side chains. The side chains are the nitrogenous bases, C's, A's, G's, and T's. And those are what's pairing with the complements on the other strand. Does that make sense? Do you remember what I said? What do T's, what does the pyrimidine T bind to? What is its complement? Remember I said earlier it's A. And how many hydrogen bonds? By the way, these dotted lines represent, this is a hydrogen bond. These dotted lines are another hydrogen bonds. How many? How many hydrogen bonds between the A and the T? Two. And what does G bind to? What's the complement for guanine? That's right, C's or cytosine. How many hydrogen bonds form between the two complements? Three. What does A bind to? T with two hydrogen bonds. What does C bind to? G with three hydrogen bonds. Did you follow that? So it's very interesting stuff, right? So that's how DNA is structured. DNA has two strands. The strands are directional with a five prime end and a three prime end. The five prime end has a phosphate group hanging off. That's this, right? Or this. The three prime end has a hydroxyl group hanging off. That's this or this, right? And then the backbone is comprised of sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And then in the middle of the ladder here, you've got the nitrogenous bases, which form hydrogen bonds with one another. Good. But now let's compare that to RNA. RNA is typically single-stranded, but not always. Do you remember I told you in the virus review earlier that some viruses have genomes of double-strand RNA? It can happen, but it's the exception. So you should know that in general, RNA is single-stranded.
and in general DNA is double stranded. So let's look at the structure of single strand RNA. Look at it. Isn't, isn't it very similar to DNA? Uh, isn't it directional? Here's the strand. You have the five prime end with a phosphate group and you have the three prime end with the hydroxyl group. Don't you have the sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate backbone again? Yes, so you have a sugar phosphate backbone. By the way, I didn't mention this, but these bonds that form between these two nucleotides, you see this bond? It has a special name. It's called the phosphodiester bond, in, in case you're curious. Oh yeah, here's the term, phosphodiester bonds, or phosphodiester linkages. These are the bonds that form between the nucleotides. So when you take when you take a nucleotide and you link it onto another nucleotide, the bond between the two nucleotides is called a phosphodiester bond. And then what do you have poking out the side? You have your nitrogenous bases, C's, A's, G's, and remember it's RNA, so you have U's. And don't forget, these sugars are ribose, not deoxyribose. You see this? I know because I see the hydroxyl group on the two prime sugar, on the two prime ribose carbon. So let's do a quick concept check, number five. The anti-parallel nature of DNA refers to what? A, it's charged phosphate groups, no. The pairing of bases on one strand with bases on another strand, no. The formation of hydrogen bonds between the bases on opposite strands, no. The opposite direction of the two strands of nucleotides. That makes the most sense because the opposite direction, one strand's going five prime to three prime in one direction, the other strand is going five prime to three prime, the other direction it has to be D. Now, this 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 uh, A answer choice reminded me of something. A, it's charged phosphate groups. I want to share with you something fascinating that took me years to figure out on my own and you know because it's never explained in any of the textbooks it's just something i realized one day when i was a graduate student uh, a phd graduate student so you know it, it took me a long time to figure out this concept take a look at this molecule here and actually this is a concept that you could learn now and it's going to make sense of how histones work in a little bit so actually it's good that if you could follow me on this, it's going to be nice and it's going to help you out, okay? So let's look at this. This is double strand DNA. What do you notice about these phosphate groups which make up the backbone of the DNA? See these phosphate groups? What charge do they have? Phosphate groups have a negative charge. You see all these negative charges on the backbone of DNA and RNA. Look at RNA. You see how RNA has all these phosphate groups and they're all negatively charged? Wouldn't those negative charges on those phosphate groups give DNA a overall negative charge if you think about it? So if someone were to say to you, hey, what is the overall charge of DNA? Does it have a charge? Is it positively charged overall? Is it neutral? Is it nonpolar? Is DNA a nonpolar molecule? Is it a polar? Does it have a charge? Is it a negative charge? Is it a positive charge? What would you say? Well, the correct answer is it's a negatively charged molecule. Take a look here. DNA is a negatively charged molecule. You see these phosphate groups? they make DNA a negatively charged molecule. See, negatively charged molecule. You're like, why is that important? Who cares? Well, what does DNA stand for? You ever thought, what does DNA stand for? DNA stands for deoxyribose. Well, we know why it's called deoxyribose because it has that sugar, deoxyribonucleic for the, uh, the nucleotides, nucleic, acid, right? Deoxyribonucleic acid. Have you ever wondered why it's called an acid? Have you ever wondered, DNA really an acid? Like, why do they call that thing an acid, right? 
here's why, and it took me forever to understand this. It's not explained in any textbook that I personally read, but um, the phosphate groups lend a negative charge to DNA, and biochemists and molecular biologists love to call anything that's negatively charged a ba an acid, right? Anything that's negatively charged an acid, anything that's positively charged a base. Okay, this is going to help you so much when you get into biochem or molecular bio, and they call this a, a acidic residue or a basic residue or an acidic protein. That's what they're talking about. If it has negative charges on it, they refer to it as a acid. If it has positive charges, oh no, Wicket. Oh, poor Wicket. Hold on. Oh, Wicket. Wicket rolled around on his bed and fell, almost fell out. Oh, goodness. Here's poor Wicket. Oh, poor thing. He, he, he rolled almost off the table, uh, off his bed, because he was dreaming. Are you okay? Poor thing. Oh, man. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, you want to go back to bed? Yeah, go back to bed. He was sleeping soundly, and then he rolled almost off everything. Wow. Okay, he moved my monitors around. Uh, okay, sorry. So, um, so that's why DNA is called an acid. DNA is called an acid because it has a net negative charge. Believe it or not, that's why they call it an acid. <laughs> DNA is negatively charged overall. It's an acid. Go figure. RNA, what is RNA called? RNA is ribose nucleic acid, ribonucleic acid, isn't it? So again, it's an acid. Why do you why do you think RNA is called an acid? RNA is called an acid because it has a net negative charge as well. And biochemists and molecular biologists love to call anything with a negative charge an acid you know uh, and if you're wondering about acids and bases and you want to know how acids and bases work a little bit better i have a really good video i'll link it there's a card above on me explaining acids and bases if you if you've ever wondered can i totally geek out on acids and bases to the point where I fully understand exactly why something's an acid and a base, watch that video. It's it's the best I could have come up with to explain how an acid and a base works. I think you'll like that video if you've ever been curious about what really is an acid, what really is a base, what does it mean to have pH 7 or 3? You know, what does that even mean, right? So, so you can watch that. But anyway, that's why DNA is called an acid. So let's keep going. Um, now we're going to talk about some of the three-dimensional structures of DNA. Um, what is the B DNA, the Z DNA, A DNA? What does that all mean? You know, let's go into that. So when Watson and Crick were uh, talking about the structure of DNA and they determined, you know, it's a double helix based off of Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins' work, um, they were describing essentially B DNA. B DNA is the general physiological form of DNA. Uh, basically, it's how you would find DNA inside of a living cell, right? B DNA, and it, it looks like this. It's got it's a double helix. It's a double helix, but not a perfect helix. You've got what's known as a major groove. You see this big wedge here? That's the major groove. And then you've got the minor groove. You've got the, the little groove. Oh, poor Wiki. Uh, poor Wicket's like on the ground now, all sleeping on the ground. I guess he's he's like, I need to get closer to Earth, otherwise I might fall out my bed again. <laughs> this poor guy. Anyway, you have the major groove, the minor groove, right? And this is very important for you to understand. There's about 10 bases, 10 base pairs per 360 rotation. You need to know that uh, 10 bases, 360 degree turn in, in DNA. Very important. And do you remember, look at this again. Here's a good example of the five prime end of this strand. You see this strand right here that I'm outlining right here? The other end is the three prime end. Did you see that? Five prime end has a phosphate group and the, what does the three prime end have? A hydroxyl group. And then the complement is the opposite. Five prime starts here and 
let's follow it back. Three prime n. You see how the DNA is directional but anti-parallel? Every turn of the helix, 10 base pairs, there's a major groove and a minor groove. Now here's some alternative forms of DNA. I just told you what B DNA is. And by the way, B DNA has a right-handed clockwise spiral. You see B form? This is called a right-handed clockwise. It's a right-handed clockwise turn. A DNA, that's this form right here, is also right-handed clockwise, but this is how DNA looks when it's around less water. This is less than physiological conditions. This is like if you start dehydrating the DNA, it assumes this A form. And then Z DNA has a left-handed spiral. You see this left-handed spiral. And the pho sugar phosphate backbone zigzags. The sugar phosphate backbone zigzags. You see this right here? The sugar phosphate backbone is zigzagging. And that's not the way you would see the sugar phosphate backbone of, D of B DNA, um, which is smooth and straight. You see that smooth and straight in the B DNA, zigzaggy in the Z form. Okay, and you can actually find Z form DNA with stretches of G's and C's. So, concept check number six, and then we'll take a quick little break time with. Poor Wiki, I'll, I'll check on him and make sure he's okay, but he seems fine. He's just taking a nap on the ground now. Um, concept check number six, how does Z DNA differ from B DNA? I just told you, you've got zigzag pho sugar phosphates uh, in the backbone, whereas B DNA has straight uh, and smooth sugar phosphate backbone. And then Z DNA has the left-handed turns, whereas B DNA has the right-handed turns. Okay, so let's Stop there for now and come back after a quick break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Hey everyone, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. In case you're wondering, yes, he's doing just fine. He's taking a nap on the ground. I think he was more, uh, his ego got hurt more than anything by rolling off the table onto my table. Uh, there's, by the way, there's two tables here. One uh, is higher than mine, and he kind of rolled off the higher table onto my table and kind of knocked over my pens. <clears throat> so anyway, let's get back to this chapter. So where we left off, I had told you about the structure of uh, the double helix now there's some interesting uh, things that can happen to the double helix with in and that's with regard to its helical structure you know it's called its coiling and dna when it's coiled normally has that right sided coil right turns and it has 10 turns per uh, i'm sorry remember 10 bases per turn right 10 base pairs per turn however if more turns are introduced to DNA, that's called positive supercoiling. If, if coils are taken out, if, if, if uh, turns are taken out of that helix, that's called negative supercoiling. And when positive supercoiling or negative supercoiling take place, they have to be corrected. And there's an enzyme that corrects for that uh, you know, twisting, and that's called topoisomerase. Topoisomerase is the enzyme responsible for adding and removing turns in the coil of DNA to make it right. By the way, uh, the, the, the DNA has to be packaged very tightly uh, so that it fits inside of cells. Uh, in E. coli, you're dealing with about 4.6 million base pairs so if you were to take the genome of E. coli out of the cell, it would roughly look like this image here. You see this line? This would represent the genome, the circularized chromosome of E. coli. And do you see this little dot right here? I can zoom into it for you, right? Right there. You see that little dot? Well, that represents... E. coli itself. So you see it's a thousand times bigger 
or longer I should say than uh, the size of the cell itself so um, you need to package a lot of DNA into a little E. coli space right human cells are even more fascinating you're, you're dealing with about six billion base pairs total if you're uh, you know it, it's 3.2 billion but if you're talking about both strand or no 3.2 billion per set and then you have two sets of chromosomes so you're dealing with yeah six billion actual base pairs if that makes any sense between the two sets of chromosomes you're dealing with about six feet of DNA so if you took a skin cell you take the 46 chromosomes out and put them end to end that's about six feet of dna and that's you know uh the you know taller than the average height of a of a human of dna that has to fit into each and every one of your cells so part of that obviously is the proper coiling of the dna and then we're going to deal with even more packaging that has to occur we're going to talk about that later this chapter but anyway remember what i said the relaxed DNA has about 10 turns, uh, 10 bases per turn. Um, and if you add, uh, if you add turns, that's called supercoiling or over rotating. If you remove turns, that's under rotating. That's negative supercoiling. Positive supercoiling occurs when DNA is over rotated. The helix twists on itself. Negative supercoiling happens when you remove turns from the coil. So let's take a look here. A DNA molecule 300 BP long has 20 rotations. Is this DNA molecule positively supercoiled, negatively supercoiled, or relaxed? Relaxed means normal. Well, normal would be 10 per turn, right? So 10 per turn. If it's 300 BP, how many turns would we expect? 30. Does that make sense? 30 turns. 10 BP, 30 turns. But we only have 20 turns, so we are negative, negative supercoiling. Does that make sense? And remember, with bacterial genomes, you have one circularized DNA molecule of double-strand DNA. Here's the uh, here's a scanning electron micrograph of a bacterial cell, and all this strewn about is the circularized DNA. Okay, this is the DNA that's kind of it's spilling its guts out, right? And you can see that it's packaged. The DNA is packaged. You've got the strands of DNA, and they're attached to these proteins. But remember, these are not called histone proteins in prokaryotes. These are sometimes called histone-like proteins, and they do offer some organization to the, to the chromosome, but they are not proper histone proteins. So how do bacterial DNA differ from eukaryotic DNA? This is concept check eight. How does bacterial DNA, I just told you, bacterial DNA is circularized, and that differs from eukaryotic, which is linear DNA. Linear DNA has telomeres at the end. You know, eukaryotic DNA has telomeres at the end. Prokaryotic or bacterial DNA it wouldn't have telomeres it's round also the chromatin of eukaryotes consists of dna plus histone proteins the chromatin of bacterial dna co is comprised of dna and histone like proteins so DNA, bacterial dna is not complexed with histone proteins and is circular now, here's a little bit more about DNA packaging, right? Here's some terms you need to know about chromosome, the structure of the chromosome. Euchromatin means, you know, this is what I 
call you know spaghettified chromatin euchromatin undergoes the normal process of condensation and decondensation in the cell cycle where most of the transcription takes place okay this is where most of the transcription place pl takes place heterochromatin on the other hand this is super tightly condensed throughout the cell cycle it's always condensed even during interphase uh, this includes regions where you're not really reading any genes like the telomeres the centromeres and most of the y chromosome that's where the heterochromatin is it's highly condensed compact dna not rich with genes you know there's nothing no information there for making proteins the genes don't live there and these are regions of the chromosome that are usually compact right and then remember the histone proteins are the proteins that associate with dna to make the chromatin does it surprise you that the histone proteins are positively charged if they bind to dna it should not right do you remember dna is called an acid why because it's negatively charged so histone proteins are positively charged histone proteins positively charged dna negatively charged yeah it's going to like each other right Oh, here's concept check number nine. I like this concept check question. Think about this. If you neutralize, so neutralizing their positive charges would have what effect on histone proteins? What would happen if you neutralize the positive charges of the histone proteins? A, they would bind to the DNA tighter, the negatively charged, that's a hint, the negatively charged DNA tighter. Nope. They would bind less tightly to the DNA. Yep. Or not at all, right? DNA is negatively charged. Histones are positively charged. Is it any wonder why DNA wraps itself around the histones? So let's look at a little bit of difference between euchromatin and heterochromatin. Euchromatin is less condensed than heterochromatin. Euchromatin is found on the chromosome arms. Whereas heterochromatin is found, remember I told you at the centromeres, the telomeres, and other specific places like the Y chromosome. Euchromatin contains unique sequences of DNA, such as the genes, right? Heterochromatin has just repeated sequences. You, you, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about these repeated sequences and what that means. What are repeated sequences? Uh, your genome is full of these repeated sequences. Are there genes on the euchromatin? Yes, the euchromatin is where the genes live. The heterochromatin is not known for being rich with genes. Okay, and the rest of this is really not as important to go through right now. And here you go, this is chromatin structure. Remember I told you your chromosomes do not exist as pure DNA? Right? When you look at your chromosomes, it's not just DNA, is it? It's your double-strand DNA wrapped around, wrapped about uh, roughly twice, actually I think it's like 1.6 times, wrapped around these histone octomers. This is a octomer, eight different histone uh, uh, structures, eight different histone proteins inside of this, this uh, purple color ball is actually eight different histone uh, pieces, uh, it's an octamer. And then you see this yellow thing, that's histone H1, that's another part of the histone, but it kind of clamps on afterwards, it clamps on to keep this ball structure together. And by the way, you see this ball structure with uh, each ball, each ball is, again, again it's an octamer of histone, it includes 1.6 times uh, DNA wrapped around it, and it includes a histone H1. That's called the nucleosome. This is one unit of chromatin. Think of a nucleosome, nucleosome as one unit of chromatin. This is one unit of chromatin. Together, it makes up the chromatin. Oh, it tells you right here, the DNA wraps about 1.65 times around the histone octamer. And then that, that chromatin uh, condenses to form a thicker filament, and then that can form these rosettes and coil up even more to form a thicker filament, and that makes up what are known as the mitotic chromosomes. Do you guys remember 
the mitotic chromosomes. This is fully compact, fully condensed DNA. But remember what I said in an earlier chapter. The DNA only looks like this during mitosis. The DNA has only compacted to this extent during mitosis. Otherwise, it's more loose like this right here, this 30 nanometer structure here. And this here is what, you know, euchromatin would look like usually. And then later on, all of it becomes condensed during mitosis. Okay. Now, again, remember I said the nucleosome is the core particle of eight, uh, uh, it's the octamer of, you know, this eight histone proteins with DNA wrapped around about two times, or 1.65 times. The histone proteins involved in the octamer are two H2A, histone 2A proteins, um, histone 2B, histone 3B, and histone 4. There's two of these, two of these, two of these, and two of these. And then remember, histone H1 clamps down, and it brings it all together. It locks in the DNA on top of the octamer. Now, look, uh, there are tails. The histone proteins have tails, uh, protein tails, that interact with the DNA and can be modified. If you modify these tails, this is an important thing for you to understand. If you modify these tails with, you know, they're, they're called post-translational modifications, you could acetylate or, um, you know, you could uh, modify these tails. If you modify uh, these tails with residues, you can actually cause the tails to sequester the DNA or loosen up to expose the DNA. So the histones, look, you see how this histone is a certain distance from this histone? If you modify the tails on this histone and this histone, these two, these two uh, nucleosomes may come together and sequester the DNA so it can't be read. And that's one way of shutting off genes. Now, if you, if you modify the tails a different way, and we'll talk about how these tails can get modified. If you modify these tails a different way, that might repel that might cause these nucleosomes to move apart and that would expose the DNA allowing it to be expressed does that make sense so um, uh, uh, epigenetics is kind of the study of this how do you modify not the DNA sequence but the access of the genes with the transcription machinery so that you can turn genes on or turn genes off right but without actually changing the, the gene itself. You know, and this is one way by modifying the tails of the new, the histones to turn off genes, to turn on genes. Isn't that interesting? So if understanding histones is useful because you could understand how epigenetics works and how, you know, you could turn off a gene or turn on a gene without actually messing with the actual gene at all, uh, just by sequestering its promoter, for instance. So again, here is a, a, his, a, a nucleosome. Uh, here's the nucleosome. Uh, this is the space filling model of a nucleosome. So you can see all of the components of the nucleosome. Remember you have two H2As, two H2Bs, uh, two H3s, two H4s. And in white, you have the 1.65 1, 1. turn of DNA around the octamer. So again, I was just touching on this earlier, but changes in chromatin, chromatin structure are important. And a lot of times they are caused by changes to the histones. So you got what are known as epigenetic changes, alterations of chromatin structure that are passed on to descendant cells or individually. For example, the agouti locus, I'm gonna show you an image of this on the next slide, the agouti locus on mice helps determine coat color. Parents that have identical DNA sequences at this locus but have different degrees of methylation on their DNA may give rise to offspring of different coat colors. This type of modification is reversible. Unlike mutations, mutations are not reversible, but epigenetic changes are 
like the epigenetic changes are what? You can methylate DNA to turn off genes. You can modify the tails of histones to, to turn on or off genes. And this also includes gene genomic imprinting. Remember, we talked about genomic imprinting as well, where the DNA of the sperm or the oocyte differently methylated, turning off genes from the mom or turning on genes from the mom. And here you can see the agouti color in mice. You've got different coloring of the coat based on DNA methylation, right? And this is a type of epigenetic control of gene expression. We'll talk about more about G uh, epigenetics later on, but it's very fascinating stuff. So remember, centromeres are the narrow waist of the mitotic chromosomes. These are constricted regions of the chromosome where kinetochore bind and spindle fibers then bind. Telomeres, remember these are the ends of the chromosomes. This is where, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the ends of the chromosomes that have to be replenished after the, the DNA is copied. We'll talk about that in a, a subsequent chapter. And by the way, you need to know this. The telomeres are made up of sequences that are usually A's and T's followed by several G's. Does that make sense? In the telomere, what do you typically see? Repeated units of adenine and thymine followed by guanine. So here we go. Let, let's look at a, this is a mitotic chromosome, probably sister chromatids. I'm looking at the telomere, the tip, and what do I see? Uh, A's and T's followed by G's. A's and T's followed by G's. A's and T's followed by G's. That's what I was talking about. And look at this. Here's something else you need to know. Um, there is a longer G-rich strand and a shorter C-rich strand. You see? So the G-rich strand extends longer than the C-rich strand. Isn't that interesting? So let's look at this here. DNA at the ends of eukaryotic chromosomes consists of tel uh, telomeric sequences. Remember the sequences are TNA followed by a bunch of Gs. TNA followed by a bunch of Gs. In A you see the G-rich strand is longer than the C-rich strand. In B you could see how this could loop back. This could loop back. In some cells, the G-rich strand folds over, it loops back, and pairs with a short stretch of DNA to form a T-loop. And why would you want to form this T-loop? Why would you want this uh, G-rich tail to loop back? Well, it prevents uh, degradation. It prevents the chromosome from getting degraded. Concept check number 10. Which of the following is a characteristic of DNA sequences at the telomeres. We just talked about this, so let's look. One strand consists of guanine and adenine or thymine. No. Uh, well, actually, they have guanine, adenine, and thymine, but it's not the right order, but, but they do. I mean, technically it's correct because there is A's and T's followed by G's, so that might be right. They consist of repeated sequences. Yeah, repeated A's and T's followed by G's. Yeah, one strand does protrude beyond the other. So I guess it is D. Uh, it's just A is kind of worded weird, but it is D. There we go. Next concept here. When in genetics, when, when we're talking about C value of an organism, what we're talking about is the total amount of DNA in the organism. So, for example, viruses would have the least amount of DNA. Bacteria and the other prokaryotes should have, uh, bacteria should have more. And then the eukaryotes, I guess Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a eukaryote, it's a yeast, have even more. So look here, lambda bacteriophage, for instance, it's a virus, has 50,000 base pairs of genome. E. coli has about 4.6 million, we talked about that earlier base pairs of genome. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is yeast, uh, eukaryotic, 12 million. Arabidopsis, 
125 million. Drosophila melanogaster, remember the, uh, the, the fruit fly? 170 million. Homo sapiens, remember 3.2 million. Zeamaze, this is corn, uh, 4.5 million. And Amphiuma, the salamander of all things, has 765 billion, right? Uh, oh, Zeom is, uh, was 4 billion 500. I'm sorry. Zeom, the corn was 4 billion 500 million. Um, the salamander, no way. This is a, you know, I'm just saying this now. 765 billion nucleotides. So that should tell you something else. Uh, the number of chromosomes an organism possesses, the number of uh, base pairs doesn't necessarily make them more advanced. Does that make sense? So that's a misconception. The more DNA you have, the 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 more advanced you are. No, um, obviously, you know. Look at look at this. I mean, even the corn plant has more DNA than humans. The salamander has several orders of magnitude more DNA than humans. Um, it's not the amount of DNA you have. Uh, it is simply the, um, the what are the composite genes and what does that what does that you know direct what what type of um, organism is formed from those genes and keep in mind that out of our entire genome only a small sliver of our genome is actually coding for proteins there is a lot of these repeated uh, sequences that we're going to talk about in a subsequent chapter which take up a lot of space, a lot of, uh, of our genome is non-coding base pairs. So these are base pairs that don't actually code for anything. So um, there's a lot of, they used to call it quote unquote junk DNA. You know, it does have functions, but it, their function isn't to actually code for protein and, and actually lend to our development. So actually we are gonna touch on some of that in this chapter, let's look at this. The types of DNA sequences found in eukaryotes. You have unique sequence DNA. Think about it, unique sequence DNA. This is basically your DNA that codes for proteins, your DNA that codes for um, microRNAs, um, your DNA that codes for, um, you know, all kinds of RNA molecules in your body. Um, and some DNA that we don't know the function of. Then, like I said, the majority of your genome is this repetitive DNA. It's just a bunch of the same repeats over and over and over and over and over again, uh, sometimes millions of times. Um, so repetitive DNA, moderately repetitive DNA, typically 150 to 300 base pair long that are repeated thousands of times mostly unknown function. We still don't really know what the function is. That's why they used to call it junk DNA. But some are important for uh, ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA genes. There are two types that you need to know about. Tandem repeat sequences, okay, and uh, interspersed uh, repeat sequences. Tandem repeats are uh, one after another. Interspersed are scattered throughout the genome. These include lines and signs, you know, the short ones and the long ones. And then you have the highly rep repetitive DNAs, highly repetitive DNA, which is often less than, sh uh, it's very short, it's less than 10 BP long, but repeat, the repeats are present in hundreds of thousands to millions of copies that are, you know, repeated in tandem or in clustered uh, regions around the chromosomes. Um, you know, all over the genome. You can find them in the telomeres, you can find them in the centromeres. They're, they're very, very common. A lot of your DNA is this highly repetitive DNA. And the example there are the microsatellite DNA. So again, um, here's a concept check. Most of the genes, genes remember are, you know, DNA that codes for protein. Most of the genes that encode proteins are found in is it unique sequence DNA? Yep. Moderately repetitive? Nope. Highly repetitive? Nope. It has to be unique sequence DNA. You need that unique sequence to code for the protein properly, right? So that leads us to the end of this chapter. A really fun chapter, hopefully mostly a review. I hope you learned a lot. 
Uh, let me know if you have any questions in the comment box below, and I'll catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.